Thank you so much for joining us tonight and welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Designs Visiting Artist, Scholar and Designer Program. I'm Gretchen Schaefer and I direct the VASD program here at the college and it really is truly wonderful to have you all gathered here for this evening as we kick off our year-long attention series. The VASD program is an interdisciplinary resource that values passionate curiosity and explores critical, diverse, and creative inquiry. This program enriches the academic experience for all of our amazing students here tonight, um, and it engages communities in the Denver metro areas and beyond. Um, so again, for all of you here this evening, for those of you joining us online, welcome. So taking notice can make the invisible suddenly visible, as if by magic. And artists and designers are expert magicians. Their methods and work direct the audience's attention to the mundane, the overlooked, the misunderstood, and the disregarded. Catalyzed by a year of reckonings, right, that we've all experienced, which helped redefine our values and relationships and inspired by art and designs, transformative ability to take notice, this series pays attention to attention. And we begin the series tonight with designer Murel Phillips, whose dynamic practice reveals how paying attention can present a radical opportunity to heal the whole self and whole communities. As a Latina founder and innovator, Mirel is a passionate advocate for women of color in STEM. She's a graduate of Dartmouth College and previously, excuse me, um, and previously led experiential design in the video game industry. Currently, she's the founder and CEO of Studio Elsewhere a design studio technology company and research lab that develops bioexperiential technologies in partnership with researchers, clinicians, and healthcare professionals to reimagine the experience of brain health, wellness, and care. Studio Elsewhere represented the first ever New York City Pavilion at the 2021 London Design Biennial and was selected to design the United Nations Pavilion at this year's World Expo. In her talk this evening titled A Floating Bridge, Murel will facilitate an inquiry into the ways environments can shape memory, experience, and our ability to heal and connect with others. Borrowing from disparate yet interconnected disciplines of Japanese garden design, open world video games, polar expeditions, and musical concert design, Murel will share how certain environmental experiences encourage singular, sustained attention and presentness, both at the individual and collective levels. Together, and led by Murel, we will co-imagine the work of dedicating our most valuable resources, things like time, attention, and collective energy, to some of our most complex and mysterious issues of health and well-being. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce Murel Phillips. Thank you so much, Remcad and Gretchen, especially for being an incredible host here. Now, I realize this format is a bit weird after the past year and a half. Every talk we've been participating in always started with someone addressing important housekeeping items. Virtual backgrounds off, no muting, questions in the chat, Jerry pants are still required. <laughs> you remember all this. So I'd like to establish some new important housekeeping items for this talk. First, I see a lot of people in the back, which I understand is near the snacks, and I totally get that. But if you want to come forward at all, there's plenty of space here, and I want to make sure that you can hear me and also see the visuals as well, too. So we welcome you if you do want to come up. If not, you're also fine. In this talk, I also encourage you to take full advantage of your senses. We're outside for the first time for one of these talks, and thank you so much for Gretchen and the team here for facilitating that. So the touch and feeling of fall air, the scent of these trees, maybe even the way some of the branches sway. As I'll get into soon, this is quite the surreal situation, a conversation reflecting upon nature's connection 
to healing and recovery in the exact site that was used towards these purposes in the beginning of the 20th century. Two, I'd also like to take a moment to have some awareness of each other. Everyone here has had to face some form of struggle, challenges, and likely some degree of isolation and loneliness during the pandemic. I know being in real life together may spark a little social anxiety, so I'm gonna coach us all through a little exercise. First, turn to someone that's near you, someone that you don't know, and just introduce yourself with your names. Now pay them a compliment. It doesn't matter whether it's based in truth or fiction, such as Gretchen, you have an excellent collection of hats. Okay. You're, you're gonna have time to talk afterwards, this is good. <laughs> All right, three. I'm hoping this feels less like a talk and more an, an invitation to process a journey collectively. We have an hour together, and this talk is not linear in the traditional sense, and that's not the way our brains work either. We'll be dipping from the present to the past to the imagined. See, I didn't say silence your phones. That's the housekeeping item in real life. <laughs> and it's Gretchen's mother. <laughs> so if you do, if there's a time that you slip away, know that you're welcomed back at your own ability to be present and engage. So let us begin. As soon as the slide moves. All right, here we go. We're gonna start 100 years ago, right exactly here. In 1921, our gathering would be in the midst of another great health crisis. It was known as the white plague or consumption, the Latin root con meaning completely and samir meaning to take life from under, all consuming of the body and mind. It targeted the lungs and disproportionately affected the urban poor. We would later know this disease to be tuberculosis. This campus would be the Jewish Consumptive Relief Society, a sanatorium of treatment at any stage of the disease. As patients, You'd be admitted here free of charge as both an isolation intervention, similar to quarantining. You came here from somewhere else in America, traveling for days with the hope of receiving this special treatment. Many physicians at the time were suggesting medical climatology, a belief that exposure to certain air, water, and nature would provide the necessary health benefits to combat consumption. Based on your gender or stage of illness, you could be prescribed Florida, the Great Lakes, Adirondacks, or right here in Denver. As part of your treatment, you'd have a bed placed outside on a terrace in order to receive a sun and fresh air treatment for several hours a day. This is called heliotherapy. The sanatorium took great pride in preparing kosher meals, providing a library with hundreds of books, social hours, and even bringing in opera singers and musical performers for the patients. The mission was in deep alignment with treating the whole person. In face of an illness known for overtaking the body and mind, the doctors and nurses were on the front lines of supporting a patient's right to art, beauty, and social connection. In essence, the environment infused with nature and humanity was an integrated, essential part of both treatment and rehabilitation. Sanatoriums were widely popular between 1900 and 1950 but there were never enough to cope with the demand of this illness, spread by humans by airborne droplets. If 100 years ago wasn't actually that long, then these ideas go back to the 17th century BC Greece. The sanctuary of Euskipulis, Epidorius, which I'm going to abbreviate to ASAP for short, was where most modern medicine, as we know it, originally had its origins. Patients made a pilgrimage across the ocean and land in order to access what was known as the time as holistic health care. ASAP was situated in, the valley rich, in a valley rich in springs at the foothills of the Mount Kurnauten, so patients could experience the scent of olive groves, rich and lush vegetation, and thermal springs for hydrotherapy. A stadium was created not just for physical exercise, 
but for outdoor performances and entertainment. Large dining halls, libraries, and even theaters were popular buildings for theatrical and musical performances. Being admitted there meant that you could participate in sporting events or musical contests, to attend to a concert or play, read books, and socialize. At the ASAP, nature, architecture, art, and design was fully integrated into traditional medicine. Just a complete sidebar on this, if we were going to create a healing sanctuary on this campus, the appropriate name would be ASAP Rocky. <laughs> Not taking any other suggestions at this time. Second aside, this image is actually an in-game capture from Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which did a phenomenal recreation of that world. It's hard to believe at any point in time, a site like a hospital was an attraction worthy of a pilgrimage. Particularly in America, we really go out of our way to avoid hospitals. In fact, a quarter of Americans don't seek out any medical care. And yet, in illness and healing, a multidimensional, non-linear journey is one of the most human experiences that we have and collectively share. Illness forces us to reckon with presentness like nothing else. In debilitation, we learn a new economy of attention and energy. Everything becomes much finer tuned. What we are capable of doing is a moment to moment calculation. We have no choice but to remove our disguise of being okay and self-sufficient. If we're fortunate, it destroys the illusion that we ever truly have been anything but interdependent. The nature of illness is isolation. We know that more intimately this past year and or so through quarantining. Yet as these historical references and our own lived experience remind us, it is the very pain of isolation that requires us to design for meaningful connection. To, de to design for a new experience of time, which flows between deep and wandering to overwhelmingly fast and intense. To design for new relationships that have different language exchanges and sometimes less speech altogether. Ultimately, to design for a new space for ourselves and our loved ones that support the act of witnessing and compassion, companionship through an uncertain journey. My first experience of this form of companionship unfolded as a child. As a family, we spent most nights after dinner seated on the porch of our home in the Gulf Coast of Florida. There was a special sensory alchemy of these nights. The cool and invigorating breeze following a thunderstorm, the scent of wet earth, grapefruit trees mixed with tobacco smoke, the nocturnal music of crickets and frogs in chorus, and the rhythm of the porch swing I rocked in. This was the backdrop of my father's storytelling. His voice sounded like the geographical roadmap of his life, textured, deep, and resonant from his upbringing in Alabama in the 1930s and 40s, an exacting diction of an Air Force veteran based in Japan and Russia, working in early computing engineering, where words constantly had to be repeated and clarified during translation. Each night, he would sit on the rocking chair and build a winding and vivid story based on his life. It was toward the end of the spring when I was 10 years old, when I first heard the shift, the longer pauses, the abbreviated sentences. It was the first indication of terminal illness, which turned out to be late stage lung cancer. Over the course of the summer, his voice, like the rest of him, hollowed until it became entirely still and quiet. I visited him in the VA hospital where, without speech, he communicated via eye rolls to nurses and doctors. My mother, an immigrant from Mexico, found herself navigating technical medical jargon and high stakes conversation in a non-native language. My older sister became the intermediary of language, at times the first to understand what something meant and needing to translate it to our mother. In taking in the white, sterile room with decaying walls and furniture, the cacophony of unintended medical equipment and a septic smell, I knew my father, like so many others that we love, found this experience to be unbearable. My dear studio teammate Misha, 
once said that spaces we design have the potential to elevate or humiliate. The difference is in attention and care. In my adolescence, I found, a com I found myself a complete outsider in the dynamic, fast-paced, and emotionally loaded world of teenage relationships, which seemed to mirror the telenovelas I grew up with. To this day, I don't blame any of you if you needed to sleep 12 hours during your teenage years because it seems super exhausting and overwhelming to be coming of age, especially during a time of social media. My alternative was delving into experiences that allowed for deep time. Long novels, old movies, forest walks, CD albums. Do you know what CD albums are? <laughs> Composing music, writing stories, and computer games. I know now that these experiences gave my brain the time and space to process complex emotions of sadness, grief, and disorientation while inducting me into a world of emotional granularity, expanding upon awareness and empathy of the human condition. This invited me to have another perspective for self-compassion. I want to take a moment to emphasize that for everyone here, particularly the students, you're attending college during a time of deep uncertainty and anxiety about our future and grief for what we've been experiencing. Deep time is your friend, but pair that with making sure to eat well, exercise, getting up sleep, be a good friend and a member of your community, and I promise you will be okay. I would also add hydrate yourself, but apparently that is advanced life seminar 3000 and we're all still trying to master this. Thank you, Gretchen, for putting it here. <laughs> what connects the different experiences I described is that they are essentially immersive experiences. It may be helpful here to define what I mean by immersion. It's experiences which induce a fully absorbed state of consciousness into a reality that is different from one's physical reality. Our brain is buying into something. A recent study at Carnegie Mellon used brain imaging when subjects read Harry Potter. And researchers saw that the movement of the characters, such as when they're flying on their brooms, is associated in activation in the same brain region that we use to perceive other people's motions. We are, in a brain-based way, transported elsewhere. I brought together these ideas with deep research and literature review of scientific studies that explore neuroplasticity. Together, it became a vision of bioexperiential design, which I brought to one of the most incredible neuroscientists I had met, Dr. David Petrino, the head of research innovation at Mount Sinai. I knew it, he could help me figure out an application. As it would happen, he had recently started working with a quadriplegic stroke patient and their family. When neurologists and other doctors said there, nothing could be done for them, and that was the bat signal for Dr. Petrino who is the living embodiment of the phrase, hold my beer. <laughs> His lab, the Abilities Research Center, works nonstop in bringing innovative technologies as quickly as possible to those that are suffering from brain disorders and takes on the impossible cases others give up on. In a true patient first attitude, he arranged for me to come and present my vision directly to the patients and family. Nothing prepares you for giving your first big client pitch in a hospital room. At the foot of the bed of a patient you'll be in service to, who incidentally can't speak or move in front of their family and a team of top scientists, doctors, and nurses. There is no webinar for that pitch. But inside that hospital room was the seed of everything that would come to be it wasn't a pitch. We were all there to riff with the various skills and in perspectives to create something together. Patient, family, neuroscientist, neuropsychiatrist, physician. No one, not even myself, knew exactly what this could be. And on the face of it, there was something assuredly crazy about it. I proposed making an immersive, multisensory, and interactive healing environment that would be inspired by the patient's safe and beloved memories. Scents, lighting, music, that would be developed in collaboration with his family, with guidance from the Abilities Research Center. We didn't have a precedence. 
but along with our creative director of physical design, Caitlin Darby, we discovered what it could be. The site the family landed on was a cliffside beach in Sicha, Spain, where the patient, a designer themselves, had always loved spending time. We deep dived into the town and the study the natural landscapes and the local flora. I came across these small chapels called Ermitas, Spanish for Hermitage or Sanctuary. We envisioned an environment borrowed from the visual language of the cliffside as well as the interior grotto of the chapels. If nothing prepares you for the first client presentation in the hospital room, then certainly nothing prepares you for showing a first rendering that includes enormous sculptural rock to a family in the midst of their life's transforming. They looked at it, they looked at me, and with what I can only imagine, with equal parts trust, with equal parts fuck it, we'll try anything, they said go for it. So Studio Elsewhere had our first gig to show what this could be. What we hadn't anticipated was how the installation itself could be therapeutic for everyone involved. We dance, we sang, and we drank our way through the installation together with the family. We became one team working towards creating a space of generative beauty. As a patient would be bedridden, we designed a canopy to create an immersive light and projection experience that could be synced to music. This is that large sculptural rock that I described. Our collaborator, Fernando Cabeting, a phenomenal botanical artist, worked on creating a stunning natural environment to make it as though the patient was floating in a field with a view to the ocean. We had programmed the environment so the family could curate and activate their own experiences. On the day the patient entered the installation for the first time, I got one of the best lessons of what our form of healing could look like. They decided to have a heavenly and uplifting experience for the first entrance, set to Enya Sail Away. Not sure if that song is too old for some of the students, but maybe some of you remember that. The patient came in and experienced a state of awe as he entered, a world totally different from the hospital. And then, for the second song, right before the patient was lifted from the wheelchair to the bed, the family played the 2003 banger Milkshake by Keyless. <laughs> the room responded to it and became a club. And the husband proceeded to give his, uh, his husband the patience one of the best lap dances of his life. And in observing this amazing moment of love, sexuality, and embodiment, it really expanded my thinking of the ways we develop tools to make life more technicolor and sensual. Because illness and mental health can flatten, they can desaturate. Dignity is important, but we can push ourselves to be so much more expansive with our goals, to design to meet anyone with where they're at at the moment, to give them agency to DJ their own healing experience. To let you know an update, that family is called Team Losers. And Lou, the patient, is going above and beyond, shattering any expectations with his rehab. They have since gone on to create their own foundation to support others going through this experience. And they are now thriving in Miami, Florida, where La Ermita, or Club Losers, is getting its 2.0 update. In that first project, the elsewhere of Studio Elsewhere revealed its meaning. Elsewhere is a word that captures both time and space. All of us are seated here, the here within elsewhere. And there's not only a physical presence in time and space we occupy together, there's also a shared attention. 
But over the course of this talk so far, we also went somewhere mentally and shared in an imagined space together. Perhaps you could imagine visual sense sounds connected to the places, the sanatorium, the Grecian sanctuary, the VA hospital, the NYC hospital. Now perhaps you felt more viscerally being on the porch swing, listening to my father with me. Maybe it brought up something in your own memory of what a safe space surrounded by love, connection, um, a connection to the natural world is, and awe. If you felt transported in the sterile white hospital room, then perhaps you tapped into something evocative of what myself and so many others feel, this deep disconnect in hospital environments that holds some of the most sacred moments of our life. Perhaps you were also able to connect with a feeling of compassion towards me, or maybe it brought up a sense of compassion for yourself and for someone you love. Now, there were others in that VA hospital room with my family and in the room with the losers. Some who in a book or movie we would have taken only a second of our attention, perhaps only in relation to the family unit. In a video game, we would call them NPCs, non-playable characters. And up until spring 2020, we as a society treated them exactly that way. And that was healthcare workers. Our society relies heavily upon these humans who have given up so much of their own lives, studies, and work to, and worked incredibly hard in the most challenging conditions to provide care to us. Now, healthcare worker was a, a healthcare worker burnout was an epidemic prior to the pandemic, but we ignored it as a society. One of those reasons, which continues to this day, is how we imagine them. We call them superheroes. But let's remember an important truth about superheroes. All of them experience trauma most in their early lives through the loss of the parent. Batman, Superman, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Captain America. We really don't hear about a superhero who just had a well-adjusted family life growing up, do we? <laughs> Unfortunately, healthcare workers aren't invincible. And our projected narrative that they can withstand, conquer, overcome, battle these conditions without it impacting their mental health and well-being is problematic. They are working in terrible conditions that require real, tangible support. And as we predicted, and we see very quickly, very clearly, they're not renewable resources. Right now, we're actually facing another huge public health crisis. There's a mass exodus of nurses, the largest and desperately needed healthcare job. That day that I came into the hospital to meet the losers and give my first pitch, I walked across the hall with Dr. Percino and Dr. Angela Riccobono, the neuropsychiatrist, to the staff break room to privately debrief. As we were talking, I looked around the room, TV, vending machine, yellow walls, there's a concept called attention restoration theory, ART, developed by psychologists Rachel and Stephen Kaplan in the late 1980s, which suggests that our ability to concentrate may be restored by exposures to natural environments. Since then, many labs have started to understand our brains and nature through various methods, reporting on the meaningful cognitive, physical, and pro-social benefits. The interior design practice, which many of you may be already familiar with, a biophilic design, integrates the art framework and it has recently gained traction, particularly over the past decade, and no doubt left, led by the efforts of one of my mentors, Bill Browning. It offers strategies to incorporate nature exposure into our interiors. This isn't just putting greenery in a space, although that's a great start but thinking about rhythmic and non-rhythmic patterns, fractals, diffuse lighting, a sense of prospect and refuge, these can be the tools to induce a more ex restorative experience of our indoors, more aligned with the natural world. When I was first exposed to these ideas, I was working in the video game industry. I've always found video games to be an incredibly sophisticated and emotionally rich medium. They're a relatively new form, so there's still so much that we're understanding and processing about the medium and its potential. There's a particular, particular genre I was most interested in called open world video games. For those, I think there are some who already know it, but for those who don't, 
These are games where the storytelling is emergent based on the environment and co-authored with the player. Game design is an orchestration of engineering, artistry, writing, and score. It's a stunningly complex tapestry of development, programming, AI, design. What we get as a player is an invitation to explore and interact in our own manner. It also uses the mechanism of time and spatialness of a journey. I'm going to use the example of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Did I hear some cheers? <laughs> Same page. As a player, your first experience of the world is awakening in the cave. The journey begins with a lack of life and disorientation. Who am I? Where am I? This is also the same questions you may ask yourself as a freshman. It provides the opportunity to be given the simplest tools you need to navigate your first steps. In these clays, some clothes, a magical slate that will be your navigational companion. You leave the cave into an awe-inspiring view of the stunning landscape, mountain ranges, valleys, forests, and lakes. The game allows for this generous extended moment. It kicks off the entire adventure to take it in, to absorb a world where the depth and richness of experience will correlate to your own depth of curiosity to explore, discover, learn, experiment, fail, and keep going and trying again. In open games world like this, you have a map that you start with and your geographical progress relates to your own development within the game. The map unlocks, but really it unfolds. Something I've always marveled at this game is how perspective is built into the journey. When you have to go to a new region, um, you have to scale up a tower and you get to the highest perspective in order to unlock it. And there you have a vision of all you've accomplished in the journey that's preceded you, and you have a view of everything to explore ahead. To wonder, to wander. One of my great pleasures in life was to go on expeditions to unique landscapes around the world, to be modestly equipped with only what I needed, and to explore, to push my body and boundaries to see what I was capable of. Then in my late 20s, I experienced a neurotrauma that would leave me with limited mobility and in chronic pain. My world became quite experientially narrow, hospitals, labs, my bedroom. An identity that I had formed around adventure and movement was no longer a reality. Over the course of my rehabilitation, I found playing Breath of the Wild also provided a different frame and perspective for convalescence, the act of healing. The journey of illness and healing is non-linear and quite atemporal. Your world seems to be defined by a lack of agency. So this idea of giving co-authorship in a virtual world and the tools to climb mountains, swim across rivers, ride a horse across a countryside, to pause to take in the stars at night next to a campfire, provided immersive moments that felt quite benevolent and seemed to turn down the volume of physical pain. I know there's a general concern that video games can keep us isolated indoors instead of going outside. But I found with great interactive experiences like Breath of the Wild, it's not binary. It's a medium like books and films can enrich our inner world and can illuminate the seemingly invisible dynamics around us. By playing Breath of the Wild, I became more and more interested in how I could experience the natural world while in a state of limited mobility. It was a gateway, a Trojan horse, that opened up the world of botanical and Japanese gardens, which in New York City, I could experience via wheelchair. A Japanese garden is an art form of profound care and attention. Every choice is intentional, and it relies upon how a visitor moves in time and space through the garden. It unfolds in these moments and vignettes, meticulously composed moss mounds, waterfalls, assembled stones, and flowering trees. It is the OG open world experience, with paths designed for a full experience to be gently realized from parts to perspective. 
Whether we walk or in a wheelchair glide through a garden, the experience it provides is one of clarifying quietness. And the sound of gentle quietness could not be a bigger luxury or scarcity in our urban cities. But I think it also speaks to any of us living in this era of noise and distraction. The garden visit can be done alone or also with others, which is a way I found an alternative to hiking with friends or being uncomfortable in a loud restaurant. It affords the room to process, to listen more deeply, not just to ourselves, but to somebody else in their journey. When the studio had developed the recharge room in summer 2019, specifically for ER and ICU healthcare workers in mind, it was a different application that actually helped evolve our ideas. And that was with a professional basketball team. We had a goal to create an a restorative environment where the NBA players could practice communal biofeedback-based experience together. Through that investigation and development, it planted the seed that the recharge room could intentionally be developed as a shared experience instead of an individual one. In March 2020, we would come to understand how critical that would be for hospital workers. A surge hit New York City and our hospitals were flooded with patients. Our small team worked with our collaborators at the Abilities Research Center to transform their clinical and research lab into a relief hub with recharge rooms. Our goal was to pilot with some of the ICU wards for a few days before opening it up. But word got out quickly that there was this weird and wonderful place in the basement of the hospital where staff could go for psychological safety in the midst of an ongoing trauma that was unfolding every day in the units. Each day, we would see hundreds of workers come through the center. While we may have thought that they wanted to be alone, the opposite was true. They came in teams and they crammed every day. They crammed every day in that space together. They had agency to choose their own experiences. And over a campfire in the woods or a sunset on the beach, they processed and alternated between quiet and conversation, reflection, connection. That bi-directional experience of moving within memory to present, to the vulnerability of sharing, and then to the compassionate act of listening, being in companionship with the rest of the community, is how we're so excited to continue to learn and understand with our brain research partners how it is a powerful intervention for resilience and mitigating the long-term impact of PTSD. Over the past year and a half over the pandemic, we've partnered with over 30 hospitals in the country to expand these environments and to get out more to healthcare workers, particularly in those serving the most disadvantaged and disproportionately um, communities impacted for COVID-19. This pandemic has been quite the character test for our society which has revealed to us who runs from the fire and ru who runs into it to be a service. For myself and our small studio at the time, we knew we were gonna show up and commit ourselves to the moment however we could. I think all of us working within the intersection of art and design can struggle with this idea of finding passion, that there's one way of working that's gonna fulfill you along the journey. But there's always self-doubt and imposter syndrome that likes to run shotgun as you try to navigate. But another reframe, which I found to be so helpful in my own journey, is just to look around you and see what's needed. What's out there that feels like an invitation for you to contribute? Can you show up to that need with the skills and ideas you have to collaborate with others right there perfectly in just that moment? There was no big strategy that first week of the pandemic for us of how we were going to build and get out these rooms. We forged from our community, we asked for help, we showed up with what we could, and we took care of each other in the process. The work of collaboration is both terribly challenging and wonderfully liberating. It is the ultimate antidote to ego to have the opportunity to allow yourself to be, feel fully seen and to see others in the process of creating something from nothing. The work we do is both transdisciplinary in our own studio, 
as well as all the projects we work on and usually includes scientists, clinicians, healthcare professionals, patients, family members, and then a constellation of creative collaborators. The need for inter interdisciplinary work couldn't be any greater right now to help with our urgent and complex societal issues. I found that being a designer is such an empowering role as you have the ability to shape and shift perspective, reimagine what is tangible and practical. One of our greatest skills, though, that I think a designer needs, particularly right now, that really requires practice and mastery, is the ability to deeply listen, observation and attention. It requires a practice of stillness, not jumping to conclusions, not to solve, not to fix right away. There's certainly a time and place for urgency and action, but that all comes from a deeper well inside of us, and if we're lucky enough, one we share with our collaborators. Over the past two years, we've been collaborating with an incredible transdisciplinary team of scientists, clinicians, and engineers, neurosurgeons and data scientists at the Center for Advanced Circuit Therapeutics, part of the Friedman Brain Institute at Mount Sinai West in New York City. Led by Dr. Helen Mayberg, a pioneering neurologist who has pushed the field of deep brain stimulation forward for patients with both mood and motor disorders, like depression and Parkinson's. Dr. Mayberg, at the time, was looking to build a novel type of brain science lab that could incubate novel research, as well as provide a rehabilitative environment for patients undergoing DPS. Do you need anything? Oh, no. Are we good? There's no blueprint for how we are going to collaborate on this lab. The only skill I felt I really had at my disposal was the ability to first listen to her and members of the team, to hear their ideas, hypotheses, requests. And then over time, this would enable us to ask better, more refined questions. I found the process of this collaboration to be analogous to being part of a jazz band of instruments, of different instruments, where the whole goal is somehow get on the same temporal structure so we can really riff. With different disciplines and expertise, there's a lot of traps. You know when you're watching a drum solo that's like going on for four minutes and the rest of the band is like, dude, come back, come on. That's the act of collaboration. You have to get in the pursuit of a harmony. And when you find that in a group of people playing such extraordinarily different instruments and playing them so well, it's one of the most incredible experiences you could possibly have. It does take a sort of humility to work with those whose fields you don't pretend to understand fully and a lot of care to plug ecosystems together. That work is the work. And that work, for me, is the goal in and of itself. To be in a long-term committed collaborative relationship that builds psychological flexibility, adaptiveness, and multi-dimensional perspective. We publicly launched QLab, our brain science lab, after eight months of piloting with patients across various diagnostics. And I couldn't be more proud of what we collectively created together, a space whose design is inspired by the Japanese gardens and tea houses that in fact aided me with my own rehabilitation, Breath of the Wild, Old Growth Forest, and we've rigorously engineered the entire environment to capture movement, facial expression, and voice in order to support the SEAC team in their efforts of groundbreaking scientific and clinical applications. As artists and designers, the other skills you will need to develop for these collaborations is how to steward a vision of something that doesn't exist. For us, that's what we can do. Imagine something when there is nothing. And that's work that you do every day when you create and design something. But you do have to find ways to invite others into this journey to be co-conspirators with you. When we were asked to design and develop an interactive center for children with neurodisabilities in an existing pediatrics unit, the common theme from the hospitals was, I don't know what this is and how you're going to pull it off. This was actually one of the rooms we were inheriting. 
Every person you collaborate with, in our case, IT, facilities, engineering, and environmental service, then hospitals, deserves to have an invitation. If you extend that in the beginning to bring them on the journey with you, then they too get to enjoy to be part of an extraordinary team bringing something new and hopeful into the world. And this is what we were able to create together. We built an entire video game world that children could interact and participate with. With only in some of these patients who come in have cerebral palsy, they're children. So there's not a universal movement that we could easily find until we discovered the head was. So using just their head movement, we re-engineered uh, interactive uh, application for them to customize and design their own butterflies who would then be their companions along their clinical journey. Those butterflies then go into the forest, into the waiting room in real time. And that is the rehabilitation room that formerly was a storage closet. Thank you. I found that some of my favorite allies and supporters I formed is with the hospital building engineers. Doing work like this in hospitals is not for the faint hearted. It is a constant hard work in the most red tape bureaucratic industry we have. And this is Ed, who was the building engineer for this project. Over a year, he watched me and my team keep coming over and over again keep showing where exactly everything was going to be and how we were gonna create this as a reality. And he was the first to get to experience it. When you have co-conspirators in a corner with you, they know that you're passionate, what you're trying to steward, what somebody can be. And then you can really attack these challenges together and have that opportunity to share in the celebration. Right now, our studio is working on a new project, which is to reimagine a neuro ICU with an incredible team of doctors, scientists, and also spiritual care. They're also known in, as being part of palliative care. Currently, we're in the discovery phase, which to us means focused on observations. Every week or so, our studio goes into the ICU to join rounds and to give our attention to what is not what we are solving, doing, imagining, just what is exactly there at the moment we are there. To bear witness to deep suffering and acute life or death situations, as well as the prodigious physicians and nurses working on the unit as one organism. It's a rare opportunity in and of itself. Since we are a studio that has worked with urgency and fast momentum in the midst of a public health crisis, I know we have developed our ability to think and move quickly. But in this case, when we looked around, we saw the need is just to first observe, to sit with discomfort and humility. That's actually best. And it's all we can do together for this phase. To observe with our senses, to pay attention to some of the most minute moments of interactions between patients, families, and staff. I'm sure many of you dream one day to have your own studio. It's one of the questions I get asked most about. And there's a lot of practical questions, the hows of it all. The hows you will learn. A lot of times it, you learn it by getting it wrong before you get it right. The why though is really the big juicy question as well as part of its discovery. And for me, there's nothing more beautiful than watching a why unfold collectively for a group of people I feel so lucky to be working with every day. The truth is the person who founds and leads the studio is ultimately a good traffic controller mixed with figuring out a way to nourish, feed, and keep the jazz band flourishing, getting them some really sweet gigs to play together at. But every team member at our studio has their own purpose and why that they're contributing. This is St team studio elsewhere recently. A few years ago, I found out on a trip to Seattle, this concept of floating bridges across Lake Washington, connecting cities with smaller islands. Floating bridges 
were historically temporal structures created by men in times of war and emergency, where they worked as a unit to fashion bits and pieces together in order to get humans and materials across water. Most structural engineers discarded the very idea of it because they had the bias of thinking that somehow they were only relevant and meaningful in a crisis. But to one engineer in the 1930s, Homer Hartley, he saw that it could be just the right concept for the needs of the bridges for Lake Washington's tricky geographical location. He put together an all-star team to build a permanent floating bridge, achieving the impossible, and to this day, providing access to millions um, of exquisite nature between the islands and the city. If we pay close attention to and listen deeply to the needs that are coming up with this time period, we most certainly will hear echoes of the past and will find paths to build for the future. In the midst of everything, that act has always given me a sense of hope and peace. Perhaps it may for you too. Thank you. We do have time for some questions for our amazing guests. So I'd love to invite the audience to raise a hand if you have a question. Um, Wait, okay, sorry, what's so your this, name? Oh, Crystal. Crystal. So nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you as well. Um, this is more of a question of just like how you grapple with this as being someone who has deeply studied biomimicry. And I have found in my limited experience with it there is a really hard tension because our built environments are environments that derive on the idea of mastery when the natural environment, we're one of the youngest species on the planet, so we know like virtually very little about the world around us, mm. but we occupy a space that we tend to sit on a seat thinking that we're masters when really we're not, but... Mm -hmm. I just want to know like how you grapple with that idea when working with concepts of biomimicry that it's usually a, a, a pale comparison to the biophilia around us. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Do you mind, for those who don't know what biomimicry is, do you mind just sure. defining it yourself too? Uh, it, b the most basic description is just like taking nature as an inspiration when you are designing things or when you are creating things because nature itself is the oldest designer and the wisest designer because mm -hmm. it's the designer of life. I mean, it, it really is this type of perspective that I find uh, incredibly exciting, inspired, and also helps close that kind of ex existential loneliness and the fact that we have this and it's available. So the act of what we're doing at the studio is this way of giving us permission to study deep time. In my, uh, the, I love that there was a recommended list of reading and one of the ones that I put in there that I think you may enjoy is called Timefulness. And it's, it's from a geologist who writes about how in studying deep time of mountains, can we have a perspective that is so much more inspired now, especially as we're dealing with complex issues of climate change. And for us to be thinking about how we work with time, and I think that is essentially in kind of answering your question, it's, I don't find it as much of a, it doesn't feel like a struggle as much as what you get to play with. There's something that to me is deeply inspiring in terms of like what you get to explore to figure out. And there's a wonderful community that we're part of um, that's a bioscience community as well too. And one way that we challenge ourselves to think. In hospitals, um, what's used uh, is, comp <laughs> it's just not great for the environment. Just about anything in a hospital is not good, for, you know. This is not one of the things that when it's put in a budget and they're looking at something, the first thing is like, but how will this affect our environment? So where does this trickle down? As we are developing what we're doing and bringing into this environments, 
we're getting assessed on our materials based on issues that are related to fire retardancy and certain codes that have been developed that also are not great for humans either. And so we have taken it upon ourselves to do our own material science research, to understand stuff ourselves so that we can then bring into the hospital and say to them, this is what we're actually bringing in with our designs. And yes, it checks off these things, but in fact, we're adding this as well too. And we're giving you this cost savings. And so sometimes when you're working in whatever your field is, you have a client and that client is gonna say, all right, we want X, X, and X. But this is what you're really called to do as a designer, is to actually see where there's a need and then not take it upon this idea of, I, nobody asked me to do this, so I'm not gonna do this. Do you think that this could help? Do you think this could be better? Then put some effort into making it. Thank you. Looking at your work and thinking about the transformation of like sometimes very mundane functional spaces into like feelingful places. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate your comments just now about timefulness and how time and um, has to play a really important role in that. Mm. And I'm thinking about repetition of behavior mm. and how we continually engage with places and how you guys in your studio approach um, something like the healthcare workers repeatedly engaging in the same places again and again in the mund m like mundane aspects of that and how interventions can be specifically targeted, not just across time, but sustaining their engagement through repetitious behavior. Mm. The question comes up of like, well, why a physical space? You know, why not the things that are just in virtual? Because when you do something in a physical space, it changes behavior. It changes the way that you have shift breaks. So by having a physical space, in an environment like a hospital where everything is running under a certain time schedule. When we work with hospitals, we work with an enormous amount of stakeholders. And this actually creates a time-based change in these environments. And so there is this integration of what does 15 minutes of walking from your unit you know, going from your unit to the room and having a 15 minute experience. And we found that actually the benefits of it start when they start walking. Because they're already imagining, anticipating, the same way that when you're like going to an event or you're going to a date or something, you just are already there imagining it. That's actually what starts happening here. And one of the reasons that if you are taking a vacation, just a fun like little trick to do, is book it well in advance so you can start actually reaping the benefits of thinking, you know, imagining it. So the behavior change is also coupled with the act of rituals. So rituals is something that, you know, if you have this incorporated, they come into the room and many have formed their own rituals of what they do, what experiences that they want to try, how, who they're bringing as well with them. And that becomes part of a programmatic you know, experience for them the week. We're gonna go and check out the sunset at 3 p.m. We're gonna go by the wall waterfall and it could be the night shift workers and it's at 1 a.m. And that to me is one of the reasons that I love very much the fact that it's physical space and an interior envi environment that's kind of inducing some of these larger changes because then it also gives psychological weight to this idea. So in healthcare workers, one of the biggest barriers that we're, we're facing is this culture that has kind of been indoctrinated is that you kind of take care of yourself last. And this idea of self-care really didn't exist because it's, I have to be strong for my patients, I have to be strong for my families, so I have to be strong for my unit. You know, how am I supposed to have five minutes to do something for myself? So to actually frame this in a way where it becomes sometimes the unit is mandating, Shayla, you're looking really stressed. You're gonna go have to sit by sunset right now and I'm gonna take you. <laughs> exactly. That is how it evolves. 
I just had a question. So you mentioned that you dealt with some work with the VA, and I'm a veteran, mm. so it's something very personal mm. to me. Um, I just wanted to know if you've seen any kind of progress, like what kind of treatments would it be for veterans dealing with traumatic PTSD, and is that something that's been progressive and has mm. been beneficial in the long run? So we are, even though I come from a veteran family, we're actually just starting our first uh, VA uh, hospital partnership um, within the next month. It's been in development for over a year, which is the speed which the VA works, which I think you're familiar with. Um, and I am so inspired by it. We are actually working first with the environmental service workers at the VA hospital. These are workers who have gotten those jobs. They're vets um, who have mental health issues, who then have a gateway program in order to become the environmental service workers at the hospitals. And so environmental service uh, means cleaners, those that are uh, taking care of all of you know, the, the rooms and the units. So during COVID, we heard so much about um, did I just go out? Hello? Um, health, like the idea of doctors and nurses that are heroes, um, the support staff, like the environmental service workers, are not one of those. They're the, they're the unsung heroes. But they are very much at the front lines. In fact, some of them are the most vulnerable who are cleaning those rooms themselves. And in the VA case, those are also vets that are susceptible. So the first um, work that we're doing is targeting just them. And what was interesting is that, and one of the reasons it's taken a while, is that was very controversial. That was this idea of, wait, wait, we're, that, that we, that is what we wanted to do, and we found great co-conspirators in um, a phenomenal chaplain team to do it, and we got a chaplain innovation grant and chaplain spiritual care. And there was an interest in saying, well, we need to give this to the surgeons and we need to give this to these doctors. And what about them? They will get this. Let's start with who's most vulnerable right now and let's see how it works for them. Let's also try to do an intervention for non-native English speakers and see what that works like because our work doesn't usually re doesn't require language, which is one of its benefits. And we also very focus on cultural competency as well, too. So that has been um, this important part of uh, not only just what our ethos is, which is how to make sure that we serve vulnerable populations, but within those communities, sometimes there are those that are even more vulnerable. So how to serve them first. Um, because of my experience with my father, the, the VA is something that I hold very dear and specifically work within the hospital communities too. Um, so. We are really excited for the applications that we look to do, both in rehab, so basically for vets who are coming back who have any type of brain injuries, um, to what these applications can look like in the hospitals. And thank you so much for your service, too. Well, I think with that, we may have to wrap up for the evening. Can we please give Nino a great round of applause? Thank you. So